Oh, sure enough. Okay. Am I on? Okay, well, before I start, um, let's have a word of prayer real quick. All right, Father in heaven, I just want to thank you um, for the chance that you have given me to, to share what I experienced, to share what you did in the um, evangelistic series, the trip that we took to, to Medellin, Colombia. Um, Lord, uh, I've said this over and over time and time again, I'm not worthy to be up here preaching for you. Um, I'm probably the least worthy of anybody in here. Um, but continually you, you call me, so I, I answer your call, Lord. So I just pray that you would use me despite myself at this time. Um, speak through me so that, uh, so that your name can be glorified and so that people can, can learn to know you better. Thank you for your great love for us, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to make sure my, my clicker is working. It is. Okay. Well, if you have your Bibles... Let's t turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Carrie just read. Um, and we're going to read chapter 3, starting in verse 5. You just heard this, but I want to read it again. And it says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So I went on a trip to Medellin, Colombia. There was myself and many other students. Uh, there was people that were there working before I got there. There are people there working after we have been there and, and you know, done what we did and left. Um, and each of you played a part because you donated money that, that went to, to fund not only me going, but other students going. Um, I needed to raise a total of $900 to go, and we ended up raising, <clears throat> for me alone, um, the, th this church and uh, Jordan Crossing and Philadelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Ames Church, um, I think they got like 15 or 1600 bucks for me, so the other 600 or 700 went to other students, and it went to, to supply, you know, so it went for furthering the gospel, because um, it's not about me. It's not about anybody else who was down there preaching. It's not about any individual it's solely about God. We are all together. We all play a part. And, and uh, I, I always get made fun of for talking with my hands all the time, so I try not to. But, um, but yeah, we all have a part to play. Um, and so, so just because I was the one that went on this, this mission trip, that doesn't put me in this exalted position or anything like that. The role that each and every one of you played was just as vital, just as important to, to the evangelism that took place. So at this time, I'm going to be going through a slideshow, um, basically showing pictures that, that I took down there. Um, many of them are, are fun times. Many, some of them are, you know, of church and, and, and stuff like that and people. Um, but this is not, pictures are always, they make everything look really good, glorious and awesome and fun and exciting. Um, the grass is always greener on the other side, um, as we all know. But... Many people have asked me to show these pictures, so I'm just going to be basically relaying my experience um, in Colombia. But again, this is, this is for the glory of God. This is not about me. This is not about anything except for God's, God's glory. So, so this is a picture I got on the Internet um, just because it was cool. And this is the picture that you see. You know, if you would research Medellin, Colombia, it's a beautiful city, um, six million people, absolutely chaotic, psycho craziness. Um, this is what it looks like in real life from on top of a mountain. If you can see this, all this right here, that's just smog. It's just black soot exhaust. It was absolutely disgusting. Um, you couldn't hardly breathe in the city. The first, um, the first week we were down there, they had to keep getting us like medicine and throat stuff because our throats were so trashed just from, from speaking night after night and breathing in this air. I remember the first night that I was there, I had an, uh, or I'll, yeah, I had an, a hotel room and I had a balcony in my hotel room with my, with my roommate. And the first morning I woke up, I'm like, oh, balcony, you know, I'm going to go out and get a breath of fresh air. So I walk out there and it's like, ah, oh, diesel. I love diesel fumes. I mean, that was pretty much the first thing that I smelled. And it's like, well, I'm going to go back inside now. So it was, it was, a, it was a pretty crazy city. Um, and I'll admit, I, as soon as I learned about what was taking place in Medellin, I didn't really want to go because there's an Adventist influence in Medellin. 
Uh, it's a city of six million people. There's, there's, I can't even remember, there's hundreds of thousands of Adventists in Columbia. So me and, and several other students were thinking, why are we wasting our time here? Why are we going here when we could be going somewhere where the gospel has never been preached? But through our experience here, we learned that just because there is already an Adventist influence there, that does not mean that there aren't millions of people who still have not learned about Christ. So there was work that was done to prepare for us to come and speak. There was translators, there was elders, there was deacons, there was Bible workers, just all these people making sure this would come together for the glory of God. And, and thanks to, to all the effort, there was, by the time we left, there was over 250 baptisms, um, and there have been even more since then. Um, so there is work to do in cities like this, and there are cities like this all over the United States. Um, well, oftentimes when we think of missions, we think of overseas, but there's a mission field right here. This is a city of six million people. We live in a city of 6,000 people. You know, I mean, there's, there's plenty of people out there who don't know about Christ. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, the way we have to teach people is by, you know, going and knocking on doors or preaching or doing evangelistic series. Um, it's simply our lives. Our lives proclaim who we know, what we do, and so on and so forth. Um, and our lives reflect the love of Christ if we have a relationship with him. And that's the key word, if we have a relationship with him. So, but anyways, um, so this was the group of us that went. Um, there was 24 of us from Southern, and then this guy here on the end, he was actually from, uh, from Mexico. But there was 24 of us, I think there was like nine girls, uh, the rest were guys. Um, and this was, our, this was our group at the uh, university, the Adventist University in, uh, in Medellin. Oops, wrong way. Um, this was our uh, in instructor, I guess you could say. He was kind of the coordinator. He organized everything. His name was Pastor Edgar El Quinta. Um, very awesome guy. Very, had a huge heart for evangelism and ministry. Um, wasn't scared to look like a crazy tourist. You know, I mean, he was, this was in you know, the middle of the city, and he's just holding up this sign for like an hour. You know, he just looked foolish, but he was all about it. He didn't care. So he was, he was a great guy. Um, this was the hotel that we stayed in. Absolutely gorgeous hotel, not something that you would imagine on a mission trip. Um, it's called Hotel Dorado, and it was on uh, LA 70, a road that was like a very popular road with bars and clubs. I mean, and every night it was very loud. There'd people, you know, all hours of the night out partying and stuff. So we, we were right in the middle of it. I mean, it was, it's, a, it's a crazy city. Um, it's the home of Pablo Escobar, um, if you guys were not aware of that. And I think most of us probably know who Pablo Escobar was, so I don't need to go into details. Um, this is from the roof. This was uh, the twelfth floor. So again, just beautiful, beautiful place to be. Um, but as beautiful as the scenery is, this experience wasn't always as beautiful. Um, this was at night. We were actually so. If you go back, so right, right over here, there's this little stadium, um, and that is uh, the football, the soccer stadium in Colombia. So we got to experience them having games at least twice a week. Two people got killed during one game. I mean, they get crazy about their, about their, their soccer down there. Um, and that was just one game that two people got killed. So, um, Okay, so basically a daily, how our day broke down, it was absolutely chaotic, crazy. Um, we would get up around 7, which isn't that early, but we'd get up around 7, go eat breakfast around 8. Um, down, we would eat here down, down in this little cafeteria area. Um, we would then go to a room and have worship together and, and talk about, you know, what our plans were for, for that evening. Um, we would go over the sermons and so on. Um, and that, we were there from 9 to 12. Then we had lunch from 12 to 1. From 1 to 3 or 1 to 4, we were preparing for sermons. Um, and then we would sit here and wait to get picked up. And as you can see, we're all just overly emphatic with excitement and energy. Um, we're just, we're drained. I mean, the whole entire time we were absolutely exhausted because um, they were, this was right after finals had gotten over. We had just moved out of our places at school, got on an airplane, fly to Columbia, and boom, we start preaching right then and there. Um, and on Fridays, we had, we had to prepare three sermons on Friday. So we had three hours pretty much to get three sermons ready, one for Friday night, one for Saturday morning, and one for Saturday night. Um, so it was, it was crazy. It was cr absolutely crazy. So this was, was one of the coolest guys that, I, that I've ever met. Uh, his name's Elkin, um, and he was my, my driver, or mine and uh, Wendy, another girl's driver that you'll see in a second. 
Um, and this was kind of cool. He had this on the back of his car. It says uh, Apocalypse 14.6, which is Revelation 14.6. Um, and it's basically, you know, one of the part of the three angels' message. And this was like a decal that was on the back of his window. So there were, there, there were vendors all over the streets that would, you know, come up and wash your windows or perform tricks and all that kind of stuff. And this was like a, a sticker and it had a whole bunch of holes in it so you couldn't really wash. But he, when people would come up and wash his windshield, he'd be like, hey, hey, go wash the back too. So they'd go up and try to wash it, but they couldn't wash it. And he's like, yeah, but I could get him to, to read the sign, you know. So, but he, was, he spoke Spanish. He didn't speak English. So this is all me figuring out through friends and translators. But he was a good guy, um, our, our driver. And this was the, uh, this guy here in the blue standing next to me. Um, his name was Pastor Alberto. And uh, he was like the, the head of the district that, that I was working in. It was... Uh, myself, next to me is a guy named Tony, uh, then uh, Tatiana, Wendy, and Sarah, and we were, the five of us were in a district together, and um, we all had translators except for Wendy right here, me and, oops, me and Wendy, we were always together, because um, we would always ride with, with Elkin to the same place, or to different places, so we would first go to, to her church uh, and drop her off, um, and then after I was done in the evening, we'd go back and pick her up, and all the kids, they didn't know me, but for some reason the kids were like jumping all over me and stuff. They're, they're fun. It was a good time. Um, but yeah, so we would go and pick her up. And this was where I spoke at. Um, that's my, one of my translators. I had five. Uh, her name was Anna, and she was from Chile. She was a uh, foreign exchange student basically at the university, and she was translating for me. Um, and this little girl was the most adorable thing in the world. Uh, I liked her very much. Her name is Luisa. And uh, she was really cute, and she'd always like come up and hug me every time she saw me. And yeah, she was she was awesome. There, all the little kids were. Um, and this is from the inside of the church that I was speaking at. Um, I can't. For Kevin here is this little guy. He's making uh, the peace signs, and I can't remember the two girls' names. But then this guy is Christopher. He could speak decent English. That was another thing that was really crazy about this trip, actually, is nobody speaks English in that country. Like, literally nobody. I'm going, because I've been to Costa Rica and Tanzania, and, and everyone spoke English. But the, nobody spoke English in Colombia. So it was, it was my first time in my life that I had truly, truly 100% experienced what it is like to have a language barrier. And it's tough. Like, it's really hard going places and trying to buy things and trying to order things. Um, so my Spanish got much better than what it was before I went there. Um, and I'm still trying to learn, but it's, a, it's hard. So, and then this is, uh, this is the church on the last Sabbath that I was there. I asked if I could take a selfie with them from, from on stage, and they were all on fire about that. So, so we did that, and just a lot of really good people. Um, it was surprising because there, with this particular evangel this evangelistic series, there wasn't a crazy amount of guests that would come flowing in all the time. Um, but these almost ended up being more of spiritual revivals for churches and getting churches fired up and getting churches excited about evangelism. And, um, and there were many people who were baptized from it. There was one gentleman, um, I can't remember his name because it was really hard to pronounce, but it was like Miguel Angel or something like that. Um, and he was a construction worker. He was a really, he was, he was a pretty, I don't know, he, his past, he was kind of a bad guy, you know. But he came into the meeting one night and he was like, I could tell that he was a guest. He'd never been there before. He was locked on, I mean, to every word I was saying, following me everywhere I was walking. Um, and as he didn't speak English either, but I was able to talk to him through somebody afterwards. And uh, I told a little bit of my story when I spoke, and he was just saying, can, can God change me? He's like, can God, can God take someone like me and, and change me? And then he, was, he heard about a, uh, a man who was actually another student's translator who used to work for Pablo Escobar. Um, and he, this, this gentleman, he had um, he'd killed somebody. You know, he was a drug dealer. He himself had been shot. He'd been in prison. Um, but now he's working in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, as an elder. And um, this gentleman that was talking to me, Miguel, he asked, he's like, do you know this, this guy? And I was like, no, I don't, I don't know him, but I've heard about him. He's like, well, I would really like to meet him. He's like, because it, I believe that if, if God can change a man like him, He's like, then God can change a man like me. Um, and so we talked for a while. He shared how he had been having struggles um, sleeping and, and all these different struggles that he was having. Um, so we prayed together, and he came back like two or three days later, and he's like, he's like, I quit smoking. He's like, I've been sleeping. 
He's like, my mom's doing better. And he told me all these things that had just happened in a matter of three days when the first night I saw him, he was like a wreck. So, I mean, it's just amazing. When, when we have faith, when we have the faith of, of a little child, amazing the things that God can do. It wasn't my prayers that, that, saved, that, you know, that made his life better. It was his faith in God. It was his, his trust that God could help him quit smoking and could help him sleep and could help fix his life. Um, because we're utterly helpless. We're worthless. I mean, we, if we try to count on ourselves to be victorious and to be good Christians, it's never going to happen. I mean, there's, we're sinners. We're, we're yeah. You know, you know what we are. <laughs> All of us are the same. So, but, but yeah, so it's cool to experience, you know, people's lives being changed and being a part of that. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the areas we preached in, they were similar to this. Like, this was kind of be like the slums, um, I guess you could say. Here's another picture. Um, and this one I pulled off of the internet just to give you an idea of what it was like when we walked down the streets. Because this is, I mean, this is identical to what it would look like walking down the streets down there. Um, so the, pretty much the city was controlled by, by hoods or gangs. Um, so the, uh, most people were, their churches were in the center of a hood or center of a gang. So it would be a fairly safe area because it was controlled by the gang. Um, however, the area I was in was right on the border of two gangs. Um, I didn't tell mom this until I got home because I didn't want her to freak out or anything. But I ended up in, in one of the most dangerous churches there. Um, and there was gang wars going on while I was there. And there was two or three people got killed like the first couple days. Um, and the people were like, you know, on guard, like protecting me all the time. I was at the, at, every time I was at the church, they wouldn't want me to go out walk around and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, it's all good. I'm like, don't worry, I'll be fine. And, but they were really like paranoid and really worried. So um, it was clear that there was some serious issues going on um, down there. But anyways, after we would get done, most nights we would go here. Not most nights, many nights. Um, my, our driver, Elkin, and his wife would take us to get arepas, which are delicious. They're like these little, well, they're these little flower things that uh, have, it's like a, it's a stuffed arepa, and it has like meat and cheese or whatever you want in them, you know, all sorts of, they're delicious, they're really good, I wish we could get them here, but, so that's me, Carlos, and Wendy, um, we were together a lot, and then this is our, our group, we were, this is the group of us that was together quite a bit, um, except for this girl in the middle, she was just kind of straggling, dragging along that night, but, so yeah, that's what we do at night a lot. Um, this I just put on there for the pure fun of it. It's not really anything important at all, but um, the worst trouble that we had one night, Elkin's car kept breaking down, um, and I mean, it just kept dying as we were driving down the road, so finally I'm like, we'll stop, you know, pop the hood. So he pops the hood, and I checked his ground on his battery, and it was basically just falling right off. So I was like, okay, do you have, you know, do you have pliers or some wrenches? And he's like, no. I'm like, do you have any tools in your car at all whatsoever? He had nothing, like absolutely nothing. So I had this little, I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's a little Swiss Army knife that um, my, the Tater, my oldest sister, got me when she was in Italy, like I don't even know how long ago, probably 10, 12 years ago, um, and I happened to have it in my backpack. So I was able to take the little knife and jam it down in between the ground and the terminal on the battery. So he rode around with that knife in there for like two days before he actually got his car <laughs> fixed. But I left that with him as a little souvenir because um, I didn't have much money. Um, to buy gifts for anybody, unfortunately. But so there, I got it started. We got it started, and I'm just run, revving it up a little bit to make sure it would run there. So yeah. So here is some pictures from our our tourism. Um, we had two days off. We were there 18 days. Well, days off, I should say. Um, we were there 18 days, and the two Tuesdays that we were there, um, those days were or, were set aside for us to take us around, show us the city and stuff. So they told us they were our days off, but we had to be up, up at like 5 in the morning, and we weren't back till like 11 p.m. So it was like, it wasn't the day off at all. But, but this is the metro station. Uh, this was like this sky metro that we got on um, to go up over the mountains to this, um, to this park, this nature park type of thing. Um, so this is when we're basically at the top of the mountain, and I'm looking down. Um, so this here is the city, and I told you about you know, the smog, the, uh, how nasty the air was. The second we popped over that mountain, this is what it looked like. There was nothing, no building as far as the eye could see, no houses, literally nothing, just green everywhere. Um, so we're all just up there like, just breathing, like, thank you, you know, because there's some fresh air for once. So, um, but yeah, then there was this little park up there we went and looked at, and that was about all there was there. Um, these are just some little shops along the road, nothing, nothing fancy. 
Um, this is where we, there was this park, I can't remember what the park was called, but it was in the city, um, and there was these cool buildings. I don't know what this building was either, so I'm sorry, but it was a huge like touristy attraction place, and that's Wendy and Carlos, her husband again. You could always pick out the tourists because they would wear their backpacks on the front of their chests. I wouldn't do it, but it's just weird looking to me. But anyways, and uh, so there was this place. There was all these statues. I took a picture with a couple statues, but I didn't think they were appropriate to put in a sermon. So I left those out. Um, but if you want, they're up on my Facebook page, so you can get on there. <laughs> um, so this is the little robot guy who was walking around. Um, this is the, the Adventist University that we went down there. I, I could not believe what I heard when I went, so the Adventist University down there, it's like a thousand bucks a year, if that. It's like in Mexico, there's another student, like I said, that was with us from Mexico. He said he pays like a dollar a year to go to school because it's so subsidized by the government that they're like, and I, I'm not promoting that by any means because it, money's gotta come from somewhere, but it's just like, I couldn't believe an Adventist University being so cheap. And they're like, oh, well, you can transfer here, you can come here. It's like, no, I wanna live. So I decided not to, but. So this is, just because just of the breathing, I'm not because I was afraid of getting killed, just because it's so hard to breathe down there. Like, it was awful. Like, I was excited to come home just so I could breathe our air, like, honestly. Um, this is where, I don't know why we took this picture. It was a green room, and we were hoping to all get in, in the green thing so we could make this cool picture, but there was too many of us. So this was in, like, the computer science building or something down there. Um, this was a rock that we climbed called El Peñol. Um, it was, it's supposedly the largest rock in the world. I don't, I haven't fact checked that, but that's what they told us is that it was the largest rock in the world. So um, we climbed that and it was 740 steps. So there's us at the top at the, at the 740 mark. And this is what it was like when you were on the top looking out. So absolutely beautiful, you know, breathtaking um, scenery. So we hung up out, hung out up there for, you know, probably close to an hour or so, just enjoying it and soaking it in. So that was nice. Um, then this is where we were, this happened all the time, actually. We would be, on our days off, it would take a really long time to get from one place to the next. Um, so we would be in the bus for an hour because those city streets were the worst streets I've ever been on. I mean, it's just, traffic lights mean nothing, stop signs mean nothing. I mean, it's just, lines mean nothing. It's just, everyone's just everywhere. So driving a, a big bus around a city, you can imagine it was kind of hard. But we'd get to a place and they'd be like, okay, you can go all the way over there, uh, be back at six o'clock, and it's like 5.55. So we had like five, 10 minutes now and again, um, and then we would get back to the bus when we were supposed to, and we would wait for the driver for 45 minutes to an hour, so it's like, so we could have been out, but this happened on, on the regular, so it's kinda, they were, they were a little slow on keeping time down there, but, but anyway, so that was, we had fun, you know, we had good experiences, but that wasn't our purpose, our purpose was preaching. Our purpose was going there for evangelism. So again, this is Wendy. I don't actually have any pictures of me preaching down there um, because I was preaching and there was nobody there to take pictures of me. Um, Caleb when he was with me in Costa Rica, you know, so he was able to take some. And in Africa, Taryn was there so she could take some. But um, So here's Wendy. She's preaching. She's, she spoke in Spanish, so she was able to, she didn't have to have a translator or anything. Um, but we went down there to help lead people to Christ. That was our sole purpose. Um, so because, because of all the work that, that was put in by you guys, raising money, by us going down there, by the churches, there are, there are names written in heaven. There are going to be at least 250 people, you know, like I said, 225 who, gave, who were baptized and gave their lives to Christ. So that means that 250 more names were written down, 250 people at least, will hear their voice called when, when God comes back, whether they're alive or dead. Um, and I want to close with a story that resonated. It, it really hit me when I, when I heard it for the first time. This was just the last night that we were there, just kind of celebrating, you know, glad, glad it was over and, and glad that we got to be part of it. Um, but I'm not going to tell the story actually yet because I want to say one more thing I forgot about. Um, so... I can't remember the verse off the top of my head. Um, maybe some of you know, but it, Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and spiritual dark, you know, that verse. Which I, does anyone know what that is off the top of their head? Ephesians? Ephesians what? Chapter 6. Okay, well, you know the verse I'm talking about. Okay, well, anyways, so 
I don't know. I've, I, I don't know what you know evil spirits can do. I have no idea. But when I got down there, I was sick for like the first five days I was there. Probably I don't know if it was exhaustion or what it was because I didn't feel sick, but I was just exhausted and I was sick because of that. But I ended up getting better eventually, so I was feeling very well for probably a week. Um, and then about six days before the trip got over, I got really sick again. Like, I don't know, it was weird because it was like a sickness I'd never had before because I couldn't explain it. I didn't have a headache, I wasn't nauseous, it was nothing. I was just exhausted, like mentally and physically drained. And not only that, but I could not sleep. I would lay there at night, and I, like the last probably six, four, uh, four to six days, I was rolling on two to four hours of sleep. Um, and I mean, so this on top of preaching and all this stuff. And so it was like, I was, I was really sick during the day, but then when I would, I would push myself to go and preach at night because I knew that no one else was going to, and when I would get up to preach, I felt wonderful. I felt perfectly fine. I felt you know, like the power of God working through me or something. I don't know what it was, but, and then I'd be done and I'd be sick again. So it was like this was going on night after night after night you know, towards the end of the trip. And it was I, the last day, um, Saturday, that we were there, um, I, I woke up so sick that I even went to our, our leader, and I was like, I, I'm like, I can't. I'm like, I, I can barely stand right now. I'm like, I can't do this. And he's like, well, there's no one to replace you, so I don't know what you want me to do about it. He's like, you have to go. So I was like, okay. So I went, and it was a miserable day, but it ended up, I ended up feeling better and ish. Um, I was able to preach, but I looked like, I see the pictures of me from that day, and I look like death. Like, you, there's, we did a message on the four horses of Revelation, so there was the pale horse. I, that's pretty much what I looked like, like, while I was preaching about it. It was, I just had, I was like green, it just wasn't, wasn't cool. Um, so, but anyways, I meant to tell that earlier, but I forgot to. So, but anyways, clearly we're not, we're not just, this, this wasn't just some sort of physical thing. I'm pretty sure this was me being attacked in some way or another. I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but I can't explain why I was sick the way I was sick, and then when I got home, I was fine. Um, because, it, like I say, it wasn't the flu. It wasn't the cold. It was none of that stuff. It was just this weird something I'd never experienced before. Um, and maybe it was exhaustion. I, I have no idea. So, but regardless, the purpose was evangelism. That was the purpose. Um, so, you know, you see these pictures and it's like, oh, it looks like you guys just went down there to have fun, you know. It really wasn't fun a lot of the time. I mean, it was, but there was lots of very, very down um, negative parts as well. But we were blessed by it, um, and I was really reminded from this experience what evangelism is all about. Uh, I started being a Bible worker in 2014 after going to Arise and got involved with the church and got involved with the politics, and I got really turned off. I got hardcore turned off. Wanted nothing to do with the church last year, school year. I, got, I started going really far down to the point that I really thought about even leaving the church. But I was reminded on this trip that it is not about, we, we can't look at each other. We can't look at the politics. We can't look at our pastors. We can't look at our elders. We have to look at God. Because when we look at people, we get shut off. We get turned off because we see the hypocrisy of each other. We see each other's faults. We see each other's issues, and we, we see each other, we, we get judged for bringing coffee to church or who knows what else, you know. I mean, getting a strange look for walking with a coffee cup, you name it, you know, whatever it is. So there's this hypocrisy that we see all the time, and it was getting to me. It was grinding me like no other, and I, I wanted to be done. But this trip helped me to remember it's not about the politics. It's not about the business, which is church. It is about winning souls for Christ. It is about letting the light of Christ shine through you by having a living relationship with him, which is hard. I'm not going to say that it's easy. It's very hard to be a Christian. So, um, but I want to close with this story. One of the guys told it when we were down there, and I'm guessing that many of you have heard this before, actually, um, especially some of you who have been around a little longer. But I want to close with this. So it says, James Milton Black was born on August 19, 1856, in South Hill, New York. He loved young people and had a passion for bringing them to Christ. One day, as he was walking through an alley not far from his home, he saw a young girl sitting on the porch of a very run-down house. Her clothes were ragged and her shoes were torn. James, rec James recognized her and knew that her father drank heavily, heavily and her mother took in clothes to wash and sew in order to make money to provide for the family's needs. 
James asked the girl if she would like to attend Sunday school the following Sunday. She responded that she would, but had nothing appropriate to wear to church. James went out and brought her, bought her a dress, shoes, hat, and delivered them to her home. The next week, James asked again if she would like to attend Sunday school, and she said yes. She began attending on a regular basis and became a very faithful servant in the church. Her time spent in the fellowship with other Christians became a very bright light in her life that was otherwise filled with misery and poverty. She came each week, always sitting in her chosen place. Every Sunday, the attendance roll was called, and each person was to respond with scripture when their name was spoken. When the secretary called the name Bessie, there was no answer. Her name was called a second time, but still, there was no response. Thinking that she may not have heard her name, James stood up and called her name a third time, but the room was silent. Concerned for the child's well-being, James visited Bessie's home after that Sunday after school to see why she had not shown up for class. And he found her dangerously ill with, walk, uh, with pneumonia. Um, and death was imminent. So she was going to die because, because of the pneumonia that she had. So James re returned home, tears in his eyes, and his spirit was deeply troubled. He searched through his music to find a song, but he could not find one. In his mind, he heard a voice say, why don't you write one? So James sat down at the piano, and in just a few minutes, he wrote the words to words and accompaniment to a song. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <clears throat> Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <clears throat> so, so basically what it comes down to is we have choices to make in this life. Those choices determine where we're going to end up. But there is one way to be saved. It is a gift from God. The grace for, the, for by grace you are saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You may not have gone on a mission trip. You may not have done Bible studies. But your life is an example to people that you are surrounded with. You cannot work your way to heaven. There is nothing that you can do to make yourself righteous in God's eyes. Jesus Christ is the only way that any of us will be in heaven. When the role is called, the only reason that your name will be called is because you accepted Jesus in your place. That is the only way. So don't get caught up and distracted with doing good works and doing this and doing this and doing this. Because when we focus on works, our attention comes off of Christ. So focus on Christ. And when the roll is called up yonder, you will be there. Our closing song is When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. It's number... 